continue uh, our discussion last last time about the types of Portland cement. Last time we went through the different types of Portland cement. And we mentioned that we have five main types of Portland cement. We have type one, which is a normal, and we normally use this when there is no special requirement like sulfate attack or you want to uh, put the structure in service uh, in a shorter time. Also, we have type two, which is a moderate sulfate resistance. And as the name implies, uh, uh, we use type two when we have, when we expect it to, uh, to get sulfate attack. And type three, we, uh, the high early strength, also as the name suggests, uh, it means that the the uh, concrete is going to gain uh, uh, the strength in shorter uh, time. We use type three in order to put the service uh, 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 as soon as possible. While type four, which is a low heat of hydration, sometimes uh, some structure required uh, a huge mass of concrete. And as a result, the uh, heat of hydration is going to entrap inside the uh, the concrete which means that the uh, temperature is going to rise and uh, consequently uh, uh, thermal cracking uh, will take place so in cases like that it's, uh, it's recommended to use uh, type 4 which is a low heat of hydration and the uh, last type which is type 5 uh, high uh, sulfate uh, resistance this one is going to be used when a uh, high sulfate attack is expected. We talked about them in greater details. And now we need to see the difference between the uh, 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 five types in terms of the uh, compound composition. We said that we have four main compound composition. We have uh, C sub 3S, we have C sub 2S, we have C sub 3A, we have C sub 4 AF. Here we put additional property with the, which is the plane fineness. Plane fineness is the area per kilogram, the service area per kilogram. And that is important in order to compare type 3 and type 1. When we talked about type 3, we say that type 3 is physically and chemically identical to type 1. So if you are going to uh, compare the uh, components, you are going to find that almost all the uh, percentage identical between type 1 and type 3. So what's the different difference between type 3 and type 1? We said that the only difference, the, uh, uh, the uh, particles size uh, are finer than uh, type 1. So the particles of type 3 uh, are finer material than type 1. And that could be reflected in the plane fineness. So in the plane fineness, the uh, area per uh, kilogram for type 1 uh, is 370, while the uh, plane fineness for type 3 uh, we are going to have 540. So it's clearly that the service area here is more than type 1. And if the uh, uh, service area is more than this one, that means the hydration process, the rate of hydration process is going to be quick in type 3. And as a result, the gain in strength is going to be much faster. Also, we talk about type 2 and type 5. We use type 2 and type 5 in when we have a sulfate attack. And in order to improve the resistance of type 2 and type 3, we need to limit the amount of C sub 3A, this one here. So if you do remember, we say that in type 2, the percentage of the C sub 3A should be less than 8%. So here we have 6%. And regarding type 5, because here we are going to expect it, a higher uh, sulfate attack, the value here, it should be uh, uh, less than 4%. So we limit the amount here so that the concrete type, uh, the cement type 2, we're going to develop moderate sulfate resistance 
and here we limit the value of C sub 3A to 4% in order to develop a highly uh, sulfate resistance to sulfate attack. And uh, we talked also about type 4. In type 4, type 4 is low heat of hydration. So also with, when we talk about C sub 3S and C sub 3A, we say that those compounds comp uh, responsible for the uh, high uh, uh, rate of hydration. So in type 4, we are going to limit the amount of C sub 3S and going to limit the amount of C sub 3A. So by limiting the amount here and there, the rate of hydration is going to be uh, slower. So it's very important to understand the difference uh, between the uh, uh, five main types and also we need to understand the relation with the uh, uh, compound composition. This one and this one and this one and that one. That is why it's very important to, uh, to study the four uh, uh, compound composition. Finally, we have the white Portland cement. The, we, we are, I think most of you have seen the uh, white Portland uh, cement. Uh, we are going to primarily use the white Portland cement for architectural purposes, like this one and that one. And the composition of the white Portland cement is exactly as uh, type 1 and type 3. We have only one exception regarding the color. The color is white. And how they manage to uh, uh, give the white color for the white Portland cement? Remember, regarding the raw materials, we used to have iron and mag magnesium oxides. And the iron and the magnesium oxide will give the gray color for type 1 and type 3. So we are going to uh, put negligible amount of iron and magnesium oxide so that the uh, gray color is not going to appear. Okay, so the white Portland cement is in, in terms of composition, they are similar to type 1 and type 3. Here, yes, we are going to limit the amount of the iron and the magnesium so that uh, the, uh, the gray color is not going to appear. Uh, and finally, here we need to talk about the mixing water. We uh, Earlier in this uh, slide, we uh, discussed the uh, uh, ingredients of concrete. We say that the concrete uh, composed of water and uh, plus cement plus sand and plus aggregate coarse aggregate or the gravel so if i have cement plus water plus sand plus gravel if i'm going to mix them together i'm going to get the uh, the concrete we talked about the uh, uh, aggregates whether it's sand or was it fine aggregate or coarse aggregate? And also, we talked about the uh, cement. Now we 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 have uh, a lot of information about the cement. Now it's important also to talk about the mixing water. The water that is going to be used in order to produce concrete, we call this mixing water. So. You may think that any type of water is going to be suitable uh, in order to produce the concrete. That is wrong. The rule is any drinkable water or potable water, which means that the, if the water, uh, you can drink it, it means that the water is going to be suitable for making concrete. So the, the, the rule is any drinkable water is suitable for making concrete. However, some non-potable water may be also be used. So, if I have drinkable water, I can use that for making concrete without any trouble. But sometimes, the uh, non-potable water, also it could be suitable. So, why you should use non-potable water? Because non-potable water is much cheaper than drinkable water. And uh, in order to produce concrete, 
it's very important uh, to look at the economic aspect. So suppliers or contractors will use unprocessed or well water if it can be obtained at a lower cost than processed water. So if I have non-potable water with a cheaper price, it's appealing for me as a supplier uh, to use the uh, uh, unprocessed water because it's cheaper. So what is the problem with the uh, uh, non-potable water or unprocessed water? We are going to have impurities. In the uh, unprocessed water, we have impurities that can affect the concrete setting time and the strength and the longer term durability. So the problem with the unprocessed uh, water, it has impurities that can affect the setting time and also it can affect the strength and it can affect the long term durability, which means that your concrete is not going to live longer. And also, if your uh, mixing water is going to contain chloride ions, uh, that is going to accelerate the corrosion, uh, corrosion of reinforcing steel. We know that uh, we have, uh, we use the, the uh, uh, reinforcing steel in order to enhance the performance of the concrete. The concrete is weak in tension. So we put the steel in order to uh, 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 improve the uh, tension uh, capability of the concrete. We call this reinforced concrete. So usually we put steel, steel rebars with the concrete. And if you are going to uh, use mixing water that uh, contains chloride ions, that will, will uh, make corrosion for your steel rebars. So we need to differentiate between the plain concrete and reinforced concrete. If you have plain concrete, that it means that you don't have steel rebars. You don't have reinforcing steel. If it's reinforced concrete, it means that uh, it contains uh, reinforcing steel or rebars. So if I'm going to use uh, uh, unprocessed water. How that is going to be done? We have a criteria for that. We have criteria for that. So the acceptable criteria for questionable water, questionable water, it means that uh, uh, the water uh, contains impurities. So we have criteria for that, and that criteria, uh, criteria are specified in ASTIN C94. So we need to understand uh, the uh, criteria itself. We have a, a criterion on the compressive strength, and also we have criterion on the set time. So let's say that I made uh, uh, cubes, co uh, concrete cubes. The first one here with drinkable water, and the second one here with the questionable water. So I made the uh, two cubes, one with the uh, uh, drinkable water and the other one with questionable water. And let's say that the uh, compressive strength for the drinkable water came out to be 100 megapascal. And the other one here came out to be 80 megapascal. The rule says the uh, cube which made with the uh, questionable water should be at least 90% of the value of the cube that made with the drinkable water. So if this one is 80 and this one is 100, 100, 100 megapascal, that means the uh, water is not acceptable. But if the value here came out to be 91 megapascal, then since the percentage is more than 90%, then it's acceptable to use the unprocessed uh, water or questionable water. This is the uh, uh, first uh, uh, criteria regarding the compressive strength. The other criterion, it's about the set time or the setting time. 
So assume I made the uh, this one here. We uh, have uh, quatsch, here I have question of water, and here I have uh, drinkable water. Now I need to check the setting time. Remember, in order to check the setting time, we use the VCAT apparatus, right? In order to measure the uh, uh, initial time and the final time, right? Initial setting time and in final setting time. So we have also uh, uh, conditions in order to use the questionable water uh, uh, in terms of setting time. So here, assume that the uh, initial or the final setting time came out to be uh, uh, five hours. And uh, for the uh, questionable water, came out to be four hours. Is that acceptable or not? The uh, criterion says that the uh, questionable water should not be one hour less. So the uh, uh, cement paste made with the questionable water should not have uh, a setting time less than one hour from the uh, uh, specimen made with drinkable water. So if this one is five hours and this one is four hours, then it's acceptable. If this one is three hours, then it's not ac accept acceptable because it's less than uh, one hours. Also, uh, it should not be more than one and a half hours. So if this one is five hours and this one is six hour hours, then it's acceptable. But if this one is seven hours, it's not acceptable because it's more than one, uh, one and a half hours. So make sure that you understand the uh, criteria whether for, for the compressive strength and also for the setting time. We have criterion regarding the compressive strength. The uh, uh, cube made with the questionable water should be more than 90% uh, compared with the cube made with the uh, uh, potable water or drinkable water. And also the setting time should should not be one hour less or one and a half hours more compared with the uh, uh, paste made with the potable or distilled water. Also, we have uh, we have conditions on the sea water. We know that the sea water uh, uh, contains dissolved salts. So, if the sea water uh, the uh, uh, the uh, amount of the dissolved uh, the dissolved uh, salts is up to uh, 35,000 ppm, which means that uh, megagram per liter. So it's suitable for the plain concrete. Remember the plain concrete. That means the concrete does not contain steel rebars. Okay, but it's not acceptable at all to use the seawater for the steel reinforced concrete and the pre-stressed concrete. Of course, due to the high risk of steel corrosion. So we cannot use the seawater, whether it has uh, acceptable uh, dissolved salt or not, is not acceptable to use the seawater for making steel reinforced concrete or pre-stressed concrete. Because this one and that one, they contain steel rebars which means that corrosion will take place. But if you are going to use a plain concrete, then it's okay uh, uh, if the seawater containing up to 35,000 uh, megagram per liter. Also, we have uh, uh, conditions on the acid waters. The acid water may be acceptable as mixed in water on the basis of their pH values. So you can use acid water with pH values uh, less than, oh, it should be more than 3, 3 pH. So if your acid water, it has pH less than uh, 3, then it should be avoided. So, in order to use acid waters, you need to check the value of pH. If it's 
less than three, then it should be avoided. If it's more than uh, three, you can use them. Also remember that the organic acids, such, such as uh, tonic acids, can, uh, can have significant effect on strings at higher concentration. So organic acid is dangerous. It's better to avoid uh, organic acids. Finally, we have alkaline waters. Alkaline waters, uh, it means that I'm going to have water with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide and if the uh, sodium hydroxide concentration is up to 0.5 percent it could be used for uh, for uh, uh, concrete to produce concrete uh, also if the potassium hydroxide if the concentration of the potassium hydroxide is up to 1.2 percent by the weight of the cement uh, that is not going to affect your strength so again, if you have alkaline waters, you need to check the uh, concentration for the sodium hydroxide and the potassium hydroxide. If the percentage of the uh, sodium hydroxide uh, uh, is up to 0.5% by the weight of the cement, you can use uh, the alkaline water. And also if the potassium hydroxide is up to 1.2%, also you can use the alkaline water. Uh, also, you, you need to remember this. We, we talked about uh, uh, alkali uh, reactivity, right? We said that uh, some uh, aggregates contain silica, and the silica is going to uh, react with the cement, and as a result, we are going to have uh, uh, pop-outs. Okay, so if you are going to use the uh, alkaline waters, that is going to increase the possibility uh, to get alkali aggregate, uh, aggregate reactivity. So you also you should be careful about using alkaline water. Of course, we have conditions for the alkali uh, aggregate reactivity. We need to have humid environment. We need to have either uh, silica or carbonate. And also we need to take care of the alkaline water. So if your uh, mixture, if your concrete mixture is critical, you need to uh, uh, take care of the alkaline water. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, if, you are, if you have any question, if you have any questions regarding the lecture, please 